Tell us about our main technology insight on the future of mobile gaming platform. So please welcome him. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nizar Ramdan. I work for ARM based in Cambridge in the uh, UK. Um, first thing, I'm super, super, super really excited being here. I've always had a dream to visit Moscow. Finally, I'm in Moscow, so it's really great. Uh, thanks a lot also for the opportunity for me to present to you uh, about ARM, how we see the future of mobile gaming platforms like the hardware going and how we can really help you here. So this is roughly what I'll go through today. I'll introduce ARM. You might have heard about ARM, but I'll be explaining a bit what ARM is. Mobile trends we see uh, coming next, mainly from a hardware perspective. And then I'll be going through a little bit more of details around the technology. I will not go too much in the technical details, but enough for you guys like to know what is coming, uh, what you should be prepared for. And then if you're a developer, programmer mainly, how can we help you? How can we, we make your life easier to make better games or more successful games? So before I start, who has heard about ARM? Even the word or knows what ARM is? Can you raise your hands? Good. You haven't seen even the name ARM somewhere? Who is mobile game developer who's more on the PC and console? So mobile? Okay, PC and console? Okay, good. All right, so who is ARM? So ARM is a company based in Cambridge in the UK that started long, long, long time ago. Uh, the processor itself started during uh, almost at the same time as the PC started in early 80s. But the company itself started in 91 in Cambridge in the UK to make processors for mobile devices. So if you take a mobile device, a mobile phone, a smartphone, today, it's a bit like a computer inside. So look underneath it, you have a motherboard like the PC, and you have lots of chips and components. Unlike the PC, you don't have expansion cards, the graphics card, the sound card. It's all integrated in chips that are directly on the motherboard. The main component in the smartphone that allows your games to run is called the application processor. It's a bit like in the PC, if you can imagine, the CPU, the GPU or the graphics card, the sound, network, everything, all in one chip. So a whole motherboard with all the expansion cards, all integrated in just one chip. That's the application processor that you have in your smartphones. All smartphones you see have the same structure. Whether it's Apple or Android phones, they all have the same structure. From Apple, we might have seen the A8, that's the application processor they use. Uh, other names like Snapdragon from Qualcomm and so on. Inside that processor, you have uh, the CPU and the GPU. So that's where ARM comes to play. We designed the CPU that powers most smartphones in the world. So more than 95% of smartphones and also tablets have an ARM processor inside. Your smartphone has an ARM processor, simply you don't know it. We don't do just the application processor, actually in the smartphone you have loads and loads of ARM processors. Processors that handle the communication, that handle Bluetooth, GPS, all the extra information that sometimes you need in your device, oh, sorry, in your game, there's an ARM processor handling these. If you do the touch, you try to do something in a game, that asks the ARM processor to do something. So that's how we fit in the uh, mobile industry. So what you, what you need to know is that your game runs on the ARM processor. We do also GPUs, so if you do graphics, then it might run on the ARM also graphics processor. So if we look at just the application processor inside, roughly what you need to know is that you have a CPU, and you have a GPU. And more and more you will see something called big CPU and little, G and little CPU. You might come across it in the press, 
or some engines you use, they will tell you, I support Big Little, or some phone will tell you, I support Big Little, and you wonder, what does Big Little mean? I'll go through it a little bit later in details, but mainly means you have two processors inside, a big processor and a small, tiny processor. And the purpose of these is to switch the game between the two depending on, depending on workload to save power, so that your battery lasts until at least the end of the day or more. Uh, these are the brands we go with. So if you see Cortex from ARM, that's the brand we go for the processor. So the CPU from ARM, then it's Cortex. If you see Mali, that's the brand we go with for our GPUs. So then you know your CPU and your GPU inside your smartphone is from ARM. We don't do just processors for smartphone. Actually, the ARM processors went a bit everywhere. From really, really tiny devices, like the smartwatches or the wearable devices, used in, in also in PCs and computers, but in also applications that you might, might not maybe think of, cars, automotive, base stations, industrial, a bit everywhere. And since we started in 93, or our customers started shipping, more than 50 billion ARM processors have been shipped. Just in 2013, all our customers shipped more than 10 billion of ARM processors. There's more than human beings on this planet. By mobile, that's what we'll focus on. It's, uh, it's a bit less. I mentioned our GPUs. I mean, our CPUs, I said, we have more than 95% market share in smartphones. But with our GPUs, we're getting quite uh, a lot of market share. We started doing GPUs after we started doing the CPUs. So that's why we are uh, building this, uh, this part of the business. Uh, what you need to retain, one Android device and three out there has an ARM GPU. Across all Android devices, whether they are smartphones, tablets, or even Android smart TVs. If you look at the breakdown between the devices, more than 30% of Android smartphones have an ARM GPU. In tablets, it's even higher. One in two Android tablets has an ARM GPU. And TVs or smart TVs, you think they might not have a GPU. Actually, they do have a GPU. It's not utilized much because you don't have a lot of gaming on smart TVs currently. But 70% of the smart TVs that are selling have an ARM GPU inside, particularly the Android ones. The Android ones is mainly in China and Asia. Uh, I don't know about Russia, smart TV, but in the West, in the UK, they are mainly still proprietary Linux-based TVs, particularly Samsung and, uh, and LG. So how does ARM make money? What's the business model? Um, I'll be going through this for two main reasons. First one, maybe you guys uh, are always interested in different monetization models, business models, how to make money differently. So I'll share with you how we make money. Might be relevant, might not be. But the second part of, of our business model explains why we have a very good visibility over the, uh, over the market. So we start by designing the processor, whether it's a CPU or GPU. It takes us roughly two to three years to design a new processor. Since the architects sit down and say, OK, we're going to do a new CPU or new GPU until we have the design finished, ready to go to customers. So we spend a lot of money doing this. A lot of cost is incurred on ARM. During that part, generally, we don't get any revenue unless we have really strategic partners. We share the design with them at an early stage. Then comes the first revenue, which is license fee. So chip manufacturers like Samsung and these guys come to ARM, take a CPU license to integrate it and make the whole chip. They pay us an initial license fee. But it's not enough to pay for the cost. Because our strategy has been we share the cost with our customers. So the second part is when they start shipping the chips or when the devices start selling. So when the smartphone goes into the market, then we get the second part of our revenue, which is royalty per device. So for every smartphone they sell, or tablet, they have to pay us a certain amount of money. We negotiate, of course, with our customers how much that value will be per device, and it depends mainly on how many they think they'll be selling. If they think they'll sell only one million, then it will be a certain price, relatively high. But if they think they can sell 50 million, 
or not sure if they can sell 50 or 100. It depends on the market, it depends on the consumers, whether they like the smartphone or not. So the price or royalty price it changes per volume. So we can set a certain price for the first 10 million, another price for what goes between 10 million and 50 million, and then a different price for anything above 50 million. So our way to share the cost or the, uh, the, the risk with our customers. The good thing with that is that it allows us, we always get revenue stream, even when uh, the devices sell for years and years. But the most interesting part is that we get uh, very good visibility how many they ship. Because our customers need to send us reports every quarter how many smartphones or chips for smartphones they, sell, they sold. And when we negotiate that price, they have to tell us how many they think they will sell every year. So we combine all that data, all these reports, and then we have pretty much very good visibility how many smartphones, tablets are selling like today, and how many probably will be selling over the next two or three years. And we do share that information with the community. So that's what I'll be going through a little bit today. If you're interested in that part of thing, like how many smartphones will be selling in the future. So looking a bit now at mobile trends in terms of volume and what's coming, what we think from ARM will be coming. These things, probably you know them already. But there are already out there more than 2 billion smartphones. A smartphone is a device capable of running games, advanced games, almost a computer. So the markets that you guys can address if you target mobile or smartphone is 2 billion potential gamers. Uh, the interesting thing is that that's increasing a lot. So last year, 1.3 billion smartphones shipped. So it's increasing really, really rapidly. Uh, if you look at laptops sold, for example, in 2013, tablets sold more than laptops. So tablets outsell laptops, and that's increasing even further and further. Some of the stats, um, smartphones that are shipping, nearly 75% of these are Android-based. So Android is a huge, huge platform in smartphones. And even the resolution, screen resolution, 2.5K resolution, which is the next level up from 1080p or Full HD, is becoming almost like a standard. The Galaxy S6, for example, is 2.5K in resolution. We see these devices going a little bit beyond the smartphone. So the same processor, the same technology that goes inside the smartphone, customers are reusing that for entry-level smartphone and even some of the wearable devices, like smartwatches. So they take almost the same processor that is in the entry-level smartphone and they put it in the smartwatch. And they take the high-end advanced processor and the super smartphone, that's what they take into tablets and people are now even putting that into laptops or clamshells. So smartphone is going beyond its really markets. And the same technology is spreading quite a lot in other areas that are really, really exciting. Why is it exciting? That overall, we estimate in 2017, there will be 4 billion, what we call internet connected or smart devices shipping with a screen. There's no reason why these devices are not capable of running mobile games. If they have a display connected to the, uh, to the internet, have almost the same capabilities of a smartphone, the opportunity for you guys is almost 4 billion devices. Mobile, of course, is the biggest part of that, 1.7, 1.8 billion, that's what we estimate. The category mobile computers, that's everything, including tablets, laptops, clamshells, and so on. The interesting thing as well, that TV and set-top box will have a huge market share in these. And these will be smart devices capable of running games as well. And the other devices, any form that we haven't thought about, like uh, wearables will be in kind of that kind of uh, area, smart watches, and say, et cetera. So we'll complement the, that, that overall picture. So the opportunity is big. I asked earlier who is in PC, who is in console, who is in uh, other devices. One thing here for you guys to notice, the tiny part is the share of uh, desktop and PC. 
So they will still sell, but compared to the rest, it's really a tiny proportion of the market. Of course, monetization is much clearer, much easier, much simpler on PC and, and console, so that's why a lot of developers are targeted. But one thing to bear in mind or think about, the size of the opportunity elsewhere. More than 4 billion devices capable of running content, smart content, including games. Uh, an interesting graph about mobile subscription and worldwide population. So, rough estimate, we're getting close to maybe uh, 7 billion human beings on this planet. The interesting figure is that there's almost 7 billion subscription for mobile subscription through an operator. Doesn't mean that every single human, including babies, have smartphones or phones, no. But means that people have more than one subscription. Two smartphones, two devices is common. And the number of subscriptions is huge. And if you look at smartphone, which is probably the device that is more interesting for you guys if you want to run games, then it's getting, as I said, 2 billion and it's increasing really, really rapidly. So it's not far when we will see 3, 4 billion existing smartphones out there for you to run mobile games. The breakdown for smartphone, as we expect in 2018, so across all mobile devices, uh, the opportunity will be quite quite significant, around 3 billion or, uh, or more. The interesting thing that the voice-only phones are not going to disappear. These are super basic phones that just do calling and texting, that's it. No smart features, they will not run any games, unless you still do the old Java games. Still 400 million of these will be shipping. But the interesting part is that the smartphone will dominate, and smartphone will be split in three different segments. What we call entry-level smartphone as are really cheap smartphones, will be probably running Android, will be capable of running mobile games like any of the other devices. They will not have the same capabilities, not the same resolution, but one billion of these will be sh selling every year. Price will be probably less than $50. We think more, $35, that will be the price of a, of a smartphone. Entry mid-range, which is a device in between, trying to aim for the really, really super high end, but better than the entry level, you will see something like 550 million of these. The price range will be anything between $100, $200, roughly. These two will be quite big in emerging markets. And then the high-end super smartphone that everyone targets generally if you're a mobile game developer, the iPhone of this world, the Galaxy S6 of this world, etc. It's still a big volume, but that's 350 million. So you, depending on what you want to try to achieve, you might want to have a multi-segment strategy. So your game, your mobile game, you want to think about ensuring it runs really, really exceptionally on that high-end super phone. It looks really, really beautiful but think about how you're going to make that game run on that mid-range, and if you want it even to run on that entry level or not. You might decide, say, okay, I'll focus only on the super high end. I won't care about the rest. But just we thought we'd share with you the figures. You will exclude 1.5 billion smartphones from your, from your strategy. If you want to target them all, then you need to ensure that will run fine. Some people say, okay, I'll just target the entry level smartphone, I can guarantee it will run on everything well. But that means on that super high-end device, you will not give a rich experience. So these are things you need to start thinking about if you want to really target this market. Just from our perspective, we tell you, we see that clearly becoming three different segments, different capabilities, and volumes are really big. So if you want a rough figure, what's that entry-level smartphone of 2018? Then what we see generally, year after year, that device that was the premium super smartphone, if you take this year, the Galaxy S6, as a reference, the year after, that becomes the mid-range. So in, in 2016, the mid-range device and the range of $200 will be almost as powerful as the Galaxy S6. Then a year after, that performance becomes entry level. So in 2017, the entry-level smartphone will be as capable as Galaxy S6. So 2018, you expect that 1 billion almost as powerful as the Galaxy X6. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. So if you think about the Galaxy S6 today, 
that's what will be that cheap $35 phone in 2018. So it's not really a poor device in terms of performance or capability. It's really a Galaxy S6 almost capable device at $35. And one billion of these will be selling. So if you take your high-end game, maybe you're using your target for the Galaxy S6, they will run easily, easily on these entry-level smartphones. So rule of thumb, super high-end becomes mid-range the year after, entry-level a year after, roughly two years, maybe three. Um, the other segment that is maybe interesting for you guys if you're targeting beyond mobile is smart TV or the TV. TV industry is flat because people are just replacing their old TVs, moving to smart TV. So overall, we estimate 250 maybe million TVs sell worldwide. People keep their TVs longer, they don't replace them every year, they keep them five years, seven years, etc. But the interesting part is that the share or the percentage of smart TVs is increasing a lot. Smart TVs are almost a smartphone with a big screen. The same processor is inside, so they are ca as capable as your smartphone. Which, is, which means that you can take your mobile games easier from smartphone to smart TV. Of course, the problem around smart TV is that monetization, app stores are not clear, like uh, what you have on smartphones, they're still to develop. But in areas like China, that's already very developed. So an interesting thing we see in China, for example, um, this is just to say, you know, smartphone and smart TV interact really well together. Standards like DLNA uh, and emergent standards like OTT make the communication uh, between the smartphone and the smart TV really easy. Which means you can project directly the content from the smartphone on the TV. So that could be potentially a way of pairing a mobile gaming experience with the smart TV. I mentioned uh, China, so an interesting thing is really happening particularly in China, a little bit worldwide, but it's a huge China phenomenon, is these cheap Android set-top boxes. They call them OTT boxes. OTT stands for over the top, which means the bandwidth the internet they have, they use what is not used above it to send data, video, game and content, whatever. So that's already quite huge in, uh, in China, and it is expected that it will hit more than 120 million in 2016. China is really, really leading here because they're super cheap. You know, in China, they didn't have consoles for a long time. It was banned by the Chinese government. So the only way to have gaming as a family is through these devices. This market is so interesting to the point that the Chinese manufacturers started making special gaming devices rather than just a set of box. So these are some of the examples we saw. ZT9, Xiao Kong, Xiaomi Snail Game, and more. People like Tencent, Alibaba are all currently designing gaming boxes for the Chinese home. These are Android capable, and they take exactly the processor from the smartphone, put it inside. They all build in stores, approach and developers to port games to these devices. So you might come across in the near future. Chinese publishers or OEMs approaching you interested in content to port to these devices. So something to bear in mind. If you're interested in the Chinese market, want to take your games out there, a potential device, particularly if you're a console developer, that's a quite close device to you guys. Because it's still game controller, big screen, same experience. Uh, smartwatches and wearable, of course, big, big, big trend. And what we estimate from all the data we have from our customers, by 2018, 500 million of these devices will be selling. A lot of these we think will be smartwatches, but it will be beyond just the smartwatch. Some of the examples, health monitors, will have them maybe even in your wear, like trainers and clothing. We see trends happening in that area as well. But as I said, probably smartwatches will be the biggest bulk of that market initially. And 500 million units in 2018. Lots of challenges around wearables. We see technical challenges and we see behavioral challenges, which means people accepting these devices. We in ARM focus on the technical challenges. So we want to ensure battery life, for example, works because you, 
smartphone, people are used to charging it every day, every two days. Not the smartwatch. If it's a wearable device, then you expect it to be weeks, if not months, without having to charge it again. So there's going to be a huge challenge on us, and we're working quite hard in ARM to make processes for wearable devices. So they're still rich in experience, smart, but will last much longer battery life. The part which is more down to you guys to think about behavioral challenges. Will people really accept wearing smartwatches all the time, get rid of their old watches? Some people buy very expensive, nice watches. They think of watches sometimes as jewelry. So how can we change the behavior of these consumers from a jewelry to a smart device that can do things? This will, do, will be down to the, of course, uh, experience that you guys will provide, whether content, whether it's gaming, etc. And that's something we in ARM don't know much about, but it's not just a technical problem, it's also a behavioral problem. You saw probably the Google Glass in the past. Will people be wearing these everywhere in the street? Unknown. So behavior will play a huge part in, uh, in this. But it seems that smartwatch is the first device to really become quite mainstream and, and interesting. The other thing that you might have heard about is virtual reality. So it is coming quite, quite, quite quickly and more and more around the, around the world. So we try to map here some of the interesting developments we saw. Of course, started in the US, Oculus and these guys, if you were at GDC or followed a bit what happened at GDC, other alternatives like Valve, even an open source one like launched by Razer, uh, Sony with the Morpheus project. Uh, but VR is not just for PC or console. VR is also mobile. And Samsung, probably, and Oculus were the first to introduce something in the space. But one thing we are seeing is that there's a huge development in China. I mean, I was going around the show floor area here and even spotted a company. I don't know whether they are Russian or not. I'll try to go and speak to them later. But VR is, is really booming. It's not going to be just one player like Oculus. You will see multiple, multiple of these devices appearing. And mobile, particularly, will be probably uh, huge or maybe more successful than other ones. Of course, you saw the Oculus VR, the Rift, but then the Gear VR was that collaboration between Oculus and Samsung. It's already available for the Note 4 and will be available for the Galaxy A6 within a couple of weeks. Uh, other mobile phone manufacturers are working on, on projects as well. So it's not going to be just Samsung. You will see some other smartphones with the companion mobile VR device. That's something you might want to think about if you do mobile games. You might want to think about the mobile VR view, or you might want to think about doing mobile VR games. There is a store already, the first VR store, VR app store actually is the Oculus VR one on the Gear VR. So there are already games. We know that in the UK there are studios who specialize now only in VR and have published games already on the Oculus Mobile VR. Sales are not massive yet because the device is still new in the market, but it is picking up. So going quickly now into a little bit what we see in terms of technology inside these devices. So I will be brief, but I said these devices are powerful. How powerful are they, these mobile devices? If you take the reference Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, which may be, if you're a console developer, you know roughly what kind of graphics capability you have. Mobile phones today are above these in terms of performance. Galaxy S6 is almost 30% more powerful than the Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3. So don't think of these devices, the mobile phones of the old days, Java days, not capable of running really strong content. They are more powerful than the previous console generation. And if you see the trajectory of performance year on year, within maybe five years, these devices could catch up with the Xbox One and PlayStation 4. So these devices are really, really, really capable. Uh, the other one I said you will hear Big Little quite a lot. What is Big Little? It means you have two processors, an ARM processor, two ARM processors, a big processor and little processor. Good news for you guys, don't have to worry about anything. It's transparent to you guys. So your, games will, your game will be running and there's a like, monitor in the system that checks the workload. If your game is requiring a lot of workload, it's loading the game, it's loading stuff from the memory, then the big processor will take that workload and will run the game. 
when you're you're playing during the level, etc., and your game maybe is casual, not very performance demanding, then the big processor will shut down, and little processor will start. This can be more than 30, 50 times during a second, so the switch between big and little. And the purpose of this is to save power, because most applications do not require a lot of processor power, but they require peaks when they load the game or do things. So we created this technology to save battery, because it's critical that your gamers can play long hours rather than stop playing because they're worried their smartphone cannot last until the end of the day. So if you see Big Little, that's what it means. It's already in devices like the Note 4, the Galaxy S6, uh, devices from Samsung, you know, chips, but also Qualcomm, MediaTek, so you see it more and more. That's what Big Little is. The other thing that you might have come across is 64-bit. Apple already support that, but Android also is supporting now 64-bit. Again, 64-bit, Good news for you guys, all your existing mobile games will run absolutely fine on 64-bit devices. So your existing 32-bit mobile games will run absolutely fine. But you might want to think about building for 64 bits because you'll get extra benefits, uh, more performance, but preparing yourself for the future where you will have smartphones with bigger memory, three gigabyte is appearing as a uh, RAM for smartphones, not long before we see four gigabytes and maybe above that six and eight gigabytes in a smartphone. So preparing yourself for potentially being able to use a lot of memory in your games. Uh, as I said, it's seamless. All the tool chains out there, you know, will support it. Uh, Epic Games, if you're in Unreal, already support it. Unity will have support quite soon. Engines like Cocos 2D also support it. So tool chains will allow you to target either very easily. Within a click of a button, you can build for the old 32-bit uh, uh, architecture or the new 64-bit devices. So this year, a lot, a lot of Android devices will be, I mean, the new high-end smartphones will be 64-bit capable. Resolution, as I said, is increasing quite rapidly. 2.5K will be quite common in smartphones and tablets as well, and not long before we start seeing that even going higher. We think VR might push the resolution again even more. So you might want to have a strategy about resolution. You might be rendering to low resolution, but bear in mind that resolution is increasing rapidly in mobile. So last part of my presentation, how can ARM help you as a developer? Quite simple, we have a developer program. We have a community that's through a, uh, a website. Uh, we do also release libraries or make technology available to developers. Uh, if you develop in console and PC, you might have heard about Enlighten from Geomerics, so global illumination, dynamic light and solution. So good news, it is now available for you as mobile game developer. It's integrated in Unity 5, so if you use in Unity, that's already integrated. Can we maybe do a quick poll? Who uses Unity? All right, Unreal Engine. Who uses their own engine, develop their own engine? Who uses another engine? Not out of these three, okay. So Unity is, is a big engine you guys use. So good news, if you're moving to Unity 5, that's already integrated. Uh, apart from that, we have a developer website. The address is very simple, maledeveloper.arm.com. You find a lot of resources. Uh, documentation tools, etc. So these are the tools we make available for free to you as a developer. Tools to analyze the performance on ARM, CPUs and GPUs, mainly on smartphone and tablets. Uh, we have a performance analysis tool that allows you to see workload between CPU and GPU. We have a graphics debugger to step through the API, uh, texture compression tool, emulators and so on. So I will not be long here, but some of the principle Actually, it's relatively very easy to use and set up. Plug your tablet or your smartphone to your laptop, download the tool, and you can start capturing uh, okay, traces from your game. It supports Wi-Fi, so you don't have to plug a cable, so you can do that over Wi-Fi. We did this with uh, Epic Citadel, if you know that uh, mobile game demo from, uh, from Epic, and we traced uh, that device, uh, that game on the, on the Nexus 10, so that's the game running, and then this is the capture, for example, we got from that game. So this is a tool called Streamline. 
allows you to see very, very quickly whether you're CPU bound or GPU bound. So here you can see the GPU is maxed out totally. That bar, that solid green bar, the GPU is really, really maxed out. CPU, a little bit of activity. Quickly, you know you need to focus on the GPU side. Don't waste time looking at CPU. You could look at it later to improve things, but the biggest gain will be on the GPU. Once you know where your bottleneck is, you can move to another tool. Yeah, these are the uh, stats. Uh, you can look a little bit further in detail about the GPU, why the GPU had to do this. So it had to stall to wait for some fragment processing in this particular scene. So that allows you to have uh, a little bit more information where the problem is. Uh, and then you can move to the other tool, which is Graphics Debugger. So that frame where you know you have a problem on the GPU side, you can capture all the traces from the API, capture all your shaders, all your textures, and then you can see which one was the, the most expensive shader uh, in terms of utilization or in terms of shader really long on the GPU. And you can see what's happening to your scene uh, call by call. So you can step through the calls and see how the scene is building up until you identify your problem. Uh, these are some of the features we added as well. Uh, so you can, for example, turn off all rendering and see uh, where you have uh, overdraw, for example, or, or, or what's happening uh, to the scene, uh, to the GPU if you turn off or, or, or rendering. You can replace all the textures with null textures, all the shaders with null shaders. So do a lot of experiments to try to narrow down where the problem is. Uh, texture compression tool allows you to compress to all the texture formats that are supported in mobile. If you're using ATC1, you know you can move now to ATC2 because most of the smartphones support that version. Or ASTC, which is, which is a texture format we created in ARM, uh, but we donated that to Cronus. So now it's an industry standard. ASTC is very advanced. It has support for all formats like LDR, HDR, all kind of combination of bit per pixel. Uh, it supports also 3D textures, so we make the tool to compress for free to you guys as well. So it's on the website. If you're a Unity developer, what we did for you is a, a guide how you can still optimize for the hardware within the Unity engine. Because using Unity, you're a little bit limited. You don't have the source code. You're not, it's not your engine. You can't access really the hardware. It's abstracted by the editor, the engine. But still, there are things you can do within that editor to be very efficient because you write at the end a little bit your shaders, etc. So we have a full guide on our website what you need to know about the hardware as a Unity developer and how you can still optimize uh, for the hardware as a Unity developer. So it's all on the website, all free for you guys. So that's the end of my presentation. MarleyDeveloper.arm.com, all these tools, documentation are free. Thanks. Any question? Thanks a lot. Your questions? Uh, does anybody has, uh, have questions? Um, so maybe... I'll be around, so if you have more <laughs> questions, uh, feel free to grab me. can go through any, if you want to know more about volumes or technology trends or tools, uh, feel free to contact me. And on the website, you can submit questions, forums, etc. so ARM engineers can answer your problems around tools or your game or technology or whatever. So uh, in that case, if we have uh, um, a little bit of time, you can uh, focus on other questions which we skip, for example, before. Uh, if if you gonna to do it, if not, uh, it depends on. Yeah, I mean, if there's any question, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Emilian. Uh, guys, if you will have some questions a little bit later, you can find Nazar everywhere here. <laughs> Something. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Emilian.